Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Ishan Ma. I'm the co-director of the Center for Christian Bioethics. I want to extend a warm welcome to all of you who are joining us in person and virtually to today's grand run on gun violence, uh, the gun violence epidemic, the facts with Dr. Roger Schultz. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, in a little bit, uh, Dr. Grace Wee will be coming up here to introduce Dr. Schultz. Beforehand, I just wanted to say a few things about the Center for Christian Bioethics. The Center of Christian Bioethics' uh, its mission is to continue the teaching and healing ministry of Jesus by integrating or connecting rigorous bioethics scholarship with theological thinking, right, as well as clinical practice. And to that end, we put together events like this one to help uh, connect scholarship that is happening in the field of bioethics with the very practical things that we can do to address healthcare concerns, including issues related to some of well, the most controversial issues, such as abortion, uh, and all the way to what we're talking about today, uh, gun violence. And also, uh, as part of our regular activities, the Center for Christian Bioethics also coordinates the uh, bioethics uh, thinking and activities of the Bioethics Consortium, which consists of right now 12 different Adventist uh, healthcare and educational institutions. Uh, and I want to also let you know, because you can see on the slide, we have the next Adventist Bioethics Conference here on the campus of Loma Linda University uh, on May 8th to 9th. And the registration for this conference will be open uh, in a few weeks. We are inviting everyone who is interested in uh, bioethics to please join us for this conference. And in this conference, you have the opportunity to network with uh, clinicians, uh, healthcare leaders, uh, everyone, uh, chaplains, everyone who is interested in bioethics across the nation in the Adventist health system. So it's a really wonderful way to get acquainted with everybody who is working in the field and to learn uh, through our workshops and events, many practical things that we can do to help us solve uh, clinical ethics issues in our day-to-day -day clinical practice. So again, I want to welcome all of you to today's bioethics conference. And I want to, before we introduce our speaker, let's have a word of prayer. God in heaven, we are so grateful to have life, to be able to gather here to think deeply about a critical issue facing our society today. We ask the Holy Spirit to pour out upon our hearts a spirit of wisdom. Please guide us, open our hearts and minds so that we can think critically and to act compassionately to make this world a better place for everyone in it. And I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hi, everybody. My name is Grace Wee, and along with Dr. Ma, uh, we're the co-directors for the Center for Christian Bioethics, and I just want to, again, extend our welcome to you. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Roger Schwelt here as our speaker. Dr. Schwelt is a noted physician, teacher, and lecturer. He's a graduate from the University of California, Riverside, where he double majored in chemistry and biology. Couldn't just pick one, had to do two. <laughs> After finishing these degrees, magna cum laude, he enrolled in the School of Medicine at Loma Linda University, graduated in 2000 with a slew of honors, including AOA and awards for academic leadership and excellence. These are notable distinctions to be sure, but lo many Loma Linda medical students probably know Dr. Schwelt more for his study notes. Even during medical school, Dr. Schwelt was noted for his ability to explain things clearly. Dr. Schwalt finished an internal medicine residency here at Loma Linda University Medical Center, a chief residency in what is now called Riverside University Health System, then known as Riverside County Regional Medical Center, and a pulmonary and critical care fellowship at Loma Linda University Medical Center. I want to add that sometime in the late 2005, I was a petrified resident on MICU, and you took the time in the late afternoon, I do remember the sun going down, you took the time to give me pointers on how to place a subclavian central line on a patient on 9100. So thank you very much for that. After fellowship, Dr. Schwalt continued teaching and caring for patients. He's currently on staff at Redlands Community Hospital and San Gregorio Memorial Hospital. He teaches medical students at Loma Linda University School of Medicine, the University of California Riverside School of Medicine, physician assistant students at Loma Linda University School of Allied Health, and respiratory care students at Crafton Hills College. And in 2012, he co-founded MedCram Videos, 
not an advertisement, just saying that a company that produces videos to explain difficult concepts to patients in the health sciences, such as EKG interpretation and acid base disorders. So Dr. Schwalt, we're delighted to have you here to walk us through gun violence, a topic that is difficult to approach, yet so incredibly pertinent in our current context. Following his presentation, Dr. Schwalt will take questions from the audience in person, as well as questions posted by our online audience. For our online audience, if you want to put questions in the chat, um, these questions will then be moderated and presented to Dr. Schwalt during the Q&A session. For those of you who are here in our auditorium, we have two mics set up on either side. And during the Q&A, just feel free to go up to either mic and address your question directly to Dr. Schwalt. So without further ado, Dr. Schwalt, welcome. Well, thank you very much, Grace. Um, you know, it was about 40 years ago that I first walked onto the campus of Loma Linda University. I was nine years old, and my father had just been accepted to the dental school uh, at the age of 41. So it's very unlikely. Uh, out of all the people I have to thank, first of all, for being here, it's the dental school. Uh, if they had not accepted my father, I would not be here. And um, so I have much thanks for that. Uh, as I said, 40 years ago, I was uh, the biggest uh, threat in my life was learning long division. At that time, uh, there was a gentleman here on this campus by the name of Jack Provancha, who is the founder of, of the bioethics program. And if you look at him, the, the more you learn about him, the more interesting it becomes because he had his doctorate not only in, in medicine, but also in theology. And I think really Loma Linda in the world is one of those unique places that really combine those two aspects that I think are very, very important is the is the spiritual, the mental, but also the physical. And there's not a lot of places that do that. And I think that's really the key. And so because of that, it's really an honor for me to be speaking here today at such a uh, at such an event uh, for, from the bioethics conference. Um, there are some notable people here in the audience. I'll just point them out. Dr. Ask, Dr. Hans, who I've worked with a lot of people. I bumped them to just coming here at the Loma Linda. And of course, Dr. Liu, who is the, the bastion, Dr. Larry Liu, who I work with for many years, who is the, the bastion of evidence-based medicine. And in, whenever I am making those MedCram videos, Grace, that you mentioned, always behind me in the back of my mind is, what's the evidence, Roger? And I'm hearing Dr. Liu's voice. So um, I'll, let me just say this, is that uh, for all of those things that you said about me that were very nice and kind words, um, I really have God to thank for that and really the, the education that I received at this institution. So um, with, with no further ado, let's, let's move forward here. Uh, maybe, oh, Grace, what happened? <laughs> See, I told you, uh, everything that I have, I, I base it on other people here and uh, there we, are we good? Okay, here we go, all right. So um, the epidemic of gun violence, we, we actually planned this topic a number of months ago. And as, we were, as this was coming closer, um, I found that it was even more of an apropos topic because of what's happened recently. This has been an issue. And today we're going to talk about it. It's going to be whenever you talk about gun violence, uh, whenever you hear this, you're hearing it mostly in the media. You're hearing it uh, from people who have an agenda and want to take a particular stance. We're going to take a completely different viewpoint and we're going to look at the statistics, the data, as we would in the medical field. So really what we're going to do here is we're going to do a soap note. Uh, in, in all honesty, a subjective, objective, come up with an assessment. And really the plan is something that we all have to come up with together because we live in a democracy. We have to work on that. But if we don't make the right assessment, there's no way we're going to have the right plan, correct? If we just throw Lasix at the, at the problem and it's not congestive heart failure, how do we expect the patient to get better if the patient's in septic shock? It's not going to get better, right? So I think this is an important thing. Let's go through this in an apolitical, methodical way. And that's exactly uh, what I intend to do. Okay, so the learning objectives are listed. Let's get down to uh, some of the nitty gritty. So how are we going to uh, come up with an idea of what to do with gun control when in some situations the guns are being used uh, to commit murders, suicides, as we'll talk about, but also um, here specifically and uniquely in the United States, we have a culture where guns are used in sport and they're used by millions of people on a daily basis without an issue. Okay, so we also have to recognize that as well. We also have a Second Amendment. And if we know anything from history, if, for instance, uh, during the American Revolution, if guns were banned uh, during the American Revolution, would we have had success against Great Britain and actually gotten our ability to get freedom? So I think we have to look at both sides of the issues in a, in a realistic way. Okay, so let's start off with first with the epidemiology and the, and the statistics. 
This is deaths in the thousands. So as you can see there on the, the left-hand side of the screen, we have cancer deaths, 600 cancer deaths in the United States every year, smoking deaths related just under half a million. What you see there on the far right are the number of gun deaths in blue, and uh, the, uh, the orange above that are the gun injuries that do not result in death. And then finally, we have car deaths there on the far right. So um, about 50,000, 30 to 40, 50,000 deaths every year in car accidents uh, and also gun deaths as well. We have major organizations in the United States that take care of transportation safety, the Highway Transportation Safety Board. So the question is, is, is are gun deaths rising to the level that, that it requires attention or is it being overblown? And I think we can safely say that gun deaths are rising to the level where it needs to be taken care of. This is not an overblown situation. This is a real situation. By the way, if I were to add car injuries to this as an orange box above car deaths, I would suspect that we would be somewhere in the operating room upstairs because there's about 2 million deaths every year that result in permanent injuries uh, from, from car accidents. But the difference is, is that cars are not designed to injure or kill. They're designed to get you from point A to point B. And there's been a lot of technological investment in the last 50 years that have made cars much safer. And so therefore, when you do get into car accidents, the chances of dying in a car accident is much less than if you are injured uh, with a car, with a gun, than it would be uh, in a, a car. So just realize that, um, that those two are a little bit different. Here's sort of a blow up on that. Again, 120,000 people are injured or killed every year with guns. I think this is something that needs our attention. We're gonna have questions at the end. Yeah, sorry. Um, actually 15 minutes of questions. So let's take a look and see where these gun injuries and gun deaths are. If you look, notice on the slide, on the, uh, the portion of the slide on the left, 54% um, of all people in the United States that die as a result of guns are suicide. Let that sink in a little bit, okay? So guns, 50, 54 out of 100 people that die from a gun every year is in the form of a suicide, okay? 43 is murder. That's where, so when unlawfully takes the life of somebody else. And 3% is other that was unintentional, uh, involved law enforcement, or had undetermined circumstances. Um, now, but the question is, is if there were no guns, would those suicides have happened in another way, right? Or if there were no guns, would those murders have happened in another way? So another question we can ask is of all the suicides that have happened in the United States, what percentage of those were from guns? And from all the murders in the United States that have occurred, what percentage of those are from guns? And you can see there on the right side that nearly 79%, 79% of US murders in 2020, which is what we have the data from, uh, which is 19,000 out of 24,000 involved a firearm. So in terms of murder in the United States, 80% is from a firearm, okay? But what about suicide? It's actually only about 53%. So 53% of all suicides involve guns. So that's uh, 24,292 out of 45,979. And that actually has remained fairly stable over the last couple of years. Now, in terms of the 80% of murders being 80% uh, of murders being a result of, of guns, that actually is the highest that it's been since we actually started uh, taking records since 1968. So, so get a sense about where we are in terms of this. Um, I think when I first looked at this, I was kind of surprised about how many of the gun deaths in this country are actually related to suicide. And it kind of brings up the idea of mental health. And that's a theme that we're gonna be seeing as we go through. Uh, another question you might have is, is what about those people that have been killed lawfully, either as you know protection, self-defense, or through law enforcement? How much of that total people that have been killed uh, does that amount to? And as you can see here, this has actually been kept the track of from 2007 to 2021, and it's about 700 people. So it's not a lot of people, it doesn't make up a lot of this, that are killed lawfully or justifiably, okay? Now, the question is, is, is it getting worse? Is the media hyping up this issue? Uh, is this a political thing? Or are the numbers actually getting worse? So if we take a look at the strict numbers, the actual numbers in 2020, 45,222 gun deaths, that's actually a 14% increase over 2019, 25% increase from 2015, and a 43% increase from 2010. 
Um, in terms of gun murders, you can see there very similar statistics, and gun suicides, also very similar statistics. But you also have to remember that the, the U.S. population has also grown in that time period. And so if you look at the population controlled statistics for that, it actually hasn't changed dramatically. Take a look at uh, those that graph on the right side of the screen. Again, the green is the suicide and the yellow is the gun murders or gun deaths. And you can, if you can imagine a line going straight across, you will see here, um, here's a green pointer. Um, this is where we are right now. And we have not reached, even with the amount of suicides and, and gun murders, we have not reached the peak that we had back in the mid, early to mid 80s on a population scale, on a per capita, okay? But as you can see here very clearly from the graph, something is happening here in the, in the last uh, maybe eight to 10 years in terms of what has happened to murders. And there's a slow increase in also in suicides. Uh, since I would say, notice, notice that about for suicides, it's about uh, 05, 06, 07. There's been a steady increase in suicides. And in just maybe the last, uh, I don't know, five, 10, five to seven years, there's been an increase in, in that as well. So what I would say here is that overall, if we were to average it, the amount of deaths from guns has not changed dramatically per capita. But even per capita in the last two to three, four, five years, we're seeing a change. There's been a shift in terms of the amount of gun uh, violence that we're seeing in this country. Okay. What about the United States versus other countries of the world? Well, we look here at gun deaths per 100,000 in terms of uh, per capita, you can see at the 11.9 in the United States. And we can look at some other very similar countries that have the same standards that we do, the same sort of GDP per capita and the, the same uh, economics GDP, if you will. Uh, 2.8 in Switzerland, Canada, 1.9. It's a, it's, it's a fraction of the amount of gun deaths that we have per 100,000. Japan is 0, 0.0. Okay, so they don't, they don't have that in Japan. Uh, it's just not something that you see. In the United Kingdom, it's 0 0.2. Uh, this is specifically looking at gun deaths. Now, do people die in those other countries for murder? Of course, but they may be using a knife or something else. We're talking specifically about gun deaths. Now, if you were to just to see this, you would say, well, what is it? What is going on in the United States? Well, here, again, gun and non-gun homicide rates by country. You can see here, um, if you want to see gun homicide rate in the United States versus other countries with similar economics to us. Okay, you can see that. Non-gun homicide rates. And you can see what's going on. This is, again, this is adjusted per population. Okay. So it, it's, it's stark, right? Okay, but let me show you the flip side. In the Americas, here we are. This is, this is what we're looking at here. Honduras, Colombia, Guatemala, Venezuela, El Salvador. Okay, they also have gun restriction rules in those countries, but there's a lot less trust and there's a lot less enforcement and there's a lot more war and guns are available in those kind of countries, okay? So giving you the full picture about what it is that's going on and you have to be able to compare apples to apples. So that's the statistics that we're dealing with in terms of gun deaths per 100,000. The nice thing about the United States that I find really nice in terms of studies is that we all have little, we have 50 experiments going on all the time, okay? And those are the 50 states. So if we want to see what would life would be like in the United States, in one area, we can look at that particular state. And one thing that the United States has more of than any other country is mobilization. People are able to move from one state to the other. So it's very fluid in terms of the types of people and people moving around. Um, but if every state has their own laws. And so long as they don't violate the constitution, every state has very different gun laws. So you can look at an experiment within the United States to see how that goes. And generally speaking, the tighter the gun laws are, in that state, the less gun violence occurs in that state. Generally speaking, of course, there are exceptions. And that has to do with a, a lot with the cities in, the, in those states, cities that are very large cities, where there's a lot of gangs and a lot of uh, maybe, you know, type of, of uh, criminal uh, organizations and the movement of guns to those cities that can sometimes offset the gun rules that might be in that state. But you can see here that the states that are darkest red 
are the ones with the with the worst adjusted death rates, and the ones that are the lightest are the ones that are the least. And, and interestingly, the two extremes are Alaska, which has the highest, and Hawaii, which has the least. Okay, so a, a lot of times people try to explain away the fact that really this is a local problem in cities and gangs, which there is some truth to that, but um, I don't think that explains Alaska. Uh, sorry, or Montana. Yeah, that's true. Bozeman is a hotbed. No, no, I'm just kidding. All right, so let's talk a little bit about um, active shooters, because this is something that has recently come about. We had gun violence in this country long before we had active shooters. This is a phenomenon that has happened really since I graduated from medical school back in 2000. And you can see this has dramatically increased. And this is a very unique situation. So active shooter is defined by the FBI in this graph as anyone, one or more people in a public space shooting uh, uh, at, at one or more people randomly. Okay, that's the definition that they use. And each one of these yellow squares represents an active shooter incident that occurred in the years that are here on the x-axis. And you can see this at the Pew Research. And, and you know, if you kind of squint your eyes, it looks like it's just been increasing, but you can see that something happened after 08. Generally speaking, there is a higher average after 08 than there was before 08. I mean, you could pick just about any year, but from my eye, that's where I, that's where I see a, a difference, okay? And it's been going up. This is 2000. I, I would hate to see with what's happened in the last uh, month where we are for, for 2022. Okay, this is really this really opened my eyes as well. This is the type of gun murders and the type of weapon that is used in, in the killing of this person. Uh, handguns make up the majority of murders, gun murders in the United States. Okay. Currently, there's 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 really the the things that get that we talk about in terms of banning are the um, are these are the rifle assault weapons, and then of course you have shotguns, which is gray, and you have NA, which I really feel bad about that we can't really figure that out because that's a big uh, amount. It would be nice to know what this is, but for the ones that we do know, the big thing that you have to understand here is that most of the gun murders that occur in the United States are handguns. They are not assault rifles. So let me clarify that because this is a real sticking point. Technically, assault rifles don't exist in the United States for the most part. They're only in the military, okay? Um, what we talk about a lot is the AR-15 style weapon. And AR-15, the AR does not stand for assault rifle. It actually stands for Armalite Rifle, which is an old company that used to make it back in the 1960s and sold the rights to Colt. I have to do my research on this. I, I don't, you know, I have to learn this. And the AR-15 is a semi-automatic weapon that is typically uh, now, since the, since the uh, copyright is off and there's no patent on it, a lot of different companies can make AR-15 style weapons, okay? Semi-automatics. Those style weapons are responsible for that amount of the gun murders in the United States. Do you see the, see, do you see the difficulty here? Okay, so you could completely eliminate AR-15s and you still are left with a sizable situation. All right, so let's, we go, we've talked about the statistics. Let's talk about the people who actually commit these, these murders. And here you see a collection of uh, some of the most recent ones. You may recognize some of these faces. Um, for, for those of you who uh, grew up here, and we're here in 2015, very, very close to the San Bernardino shooting. You may recognize uh, some of the people there as well. I think at the bottom left, bottom right-hand corner. Yep. I was here at that time. I actually knew of somebody who was shot and survived. And she, she uh, recounted her story. Arden, I was there. That was at Advent Hope, right? Absolutely. Um, so this really hit home. Okay. So what, what is it about this? So there was a, a, a there's a group uh, or two um, PhDs out of St. Paul, Minnesota, that really wanted to get into this and understand this more. And they published this the the basically the product of their research, which was sponsored by the DOJ, and a uh, 
book called The Violence Project, How to Stop a Mass Shooting Epidemic. What they did was they went through and they interviewed since 1968, all of the mass shooting episodes that occurred. Um, in a lot of these situations, the perpetrators were no longer alive. And in those situations, they interviewed their um, significant others, people that knew them, tried to get as much evidence. And for those that actually did survive, they interviewed them in prison. I think there was about five of them. Um, they, uh, again, looked at all the mass shootings since 1966, where at least four people were shot. That was their definition. Every shooting incident, schools, workplaces, places of worship since 1999, they looked at 180 different shooters. They talked to their family members, friends, colleagues, um, and basically published the results of their work. And I, I highly recommend that if you're interested in this at all, to look at this because it is, is it a unique opportunity to look at the data about why these things happen. Here's the common threads that they came up with when they looked at this. In almost all of these situations, the perpetrators had early childhood trauma, either physical, sexual, bullying, or even parental suicides, okay? Um, and the recurring theme in their life was hopelessness, despair, isolation, self-loathing, and rejection. What the authors decided, however, was that in most cases, these are the types of people that would kill themselves, okay? But what they came up with was that there was something different about what they did than the traditional suicide because they turned the hate of themselves somehow to other groups that were identified. So it was either a racial group or a gender or a religious group or even classmates at the school where, where the things had happened. Okay, so the, the proposed idea that they came up with was that these really were suicides. Okay, but they were turned into homicides because of how they dealt with the issues. Okay, they turned their self loathing to other people. And so the question is could these really be homicides? Uh, they, you, you know, when they show up to these things, they come in with body armor. Sometimes what they do is they, they are waiting for the police to come, they're waiting to be shot. And, uh, as a, and this is how they are, this is how they're going to commit suicide. They can't shoot themselves. So they want other people to shoot them. And the way that they're going to do that is to take out their anger in the process. So why is this happening all of a sudden? It's very interesting. If you look at some of the statistics, there is a shift in what is going on in our culture and in our society, a, a measurable shift of what is going on. And if we look at this as a review, increases in depression, self-harm, and suicide among U.S. adolescents after 2012, and links to technology use, possible mechanisms. As you can see, uh, we have suicide, self-poisoning, major depressive episodes, and depressive symptoms, all seemingly going up at a trigger point right around 2011, 2012, okay? Why? Anyone have any ideas? Well, you might have some ideas. I see some iPhones going up in the air, yes. It's very possible. Well, this is interesting. This was also published in the Psychiatric Quarterly. Here we have online use. So, so the problem that we run into epidemiologically is that when we have correlation, correlation does not mean causation. That's one of the first things that we learn as a medical student in uh, medical school when we take our epidemiology courses and our biostats courses, is that the only way you can show causation is if you do a randomized controlled trial and you take out the confounders. Otherwise, if you do a retrospective review or a case control, you're going to see that one thing correlates with another, but you can't necessarily make causation. But one of the things that you can do to help with that, doesn't prove it, is to show a dose response curve. If you can show that the more that someone did something, particularly in the past, shows that there was a higher of a dose leading to a higher response, that tends to make you think that that's something. That's actually what they used when they tried to show that smoking causes lung cancer. The more people smoked, the more lung cancer there was. And so here we see that as um, social media use goes up in terms of hours, we see that the percentage of low well-being goes up. How about online and being unhappy? How about smartphone use? and low well-being. So, so here's interesting, here we 
use the smartphone for about half an hour and we're feeling good because we're getting our work done. And then as we stay on it for a little bit longer, uh, it starts to go up. So this is the hours of use per day and then the well being. Okay. And if you go back, it was around this period of time that we started to have social media available. I mean, I remember Facebook was around in 2005, 2006, right? But it wasn't available really on the, on the phone app until after that. And when the iPhone came out in about 2007, it didn't have a lot of social media apps. It had a phone, right? It had a calendar, but it didn't have all of those things. Those things came a little bit later. So again, looking at more of these things, here we have around 2009. What do we see here? Social media use skyrockets at around the same time that we see depressive symptoms in girls going up and uh, we see internet use going up. Now, here, here's a potential uh, confounder, depressive symptoms in girls. It's, I think it's easier to detect the way that depressive symptoms are set up to detect those in girls than it is perhaps in boys. Boys might perhaps uh, exhibit that in a different way. Obviously, most of the mass shooters that we see are not girls, right? They're boys. But I, I don't think that boys would react differently here. So um, that is what we're seeing. Interestingly, also, if we look over a time from 1976, kind of when a lot of us in the room were hanging out with friends in high school, uh, what do we see? What are the percentage, the times per week that teenagers go out with their parents? I thought this was really interesting. Like going from 1976, I don't even know they were actually taking this data at this time, in 12th graders. And then as soon as the iPhone is released, look what happens. There's been a shift. People are not going out with their friends anymore. They're staying home. They're playing video games with their friends online or their social media. Um, look at what happens with 10th graders and 8th graders. Also a very similar decline. Obviously, 8th graders and 10th graders aren't going to go out as much with their friends than 12th graders. But right now, we're basically at the 12th graders have reached the same point as the 8th graders had before, before that. Okay. What about more likely to feel lonely? It's interesting. Right there in 2007, that's when the iPhone was released. And... Uh, that must have connected a lot of people immediately. Of course, there wasn't a lot of social media apps on it, but as that started to grow, what have we seen? We've seen an increase in that. Um, the other thing that, uh, that, I, that is not on this screen, but I've, has also been risen, uh, raised as an, a possible explanation is marijuana use. So uh, in almost uh, all of the sh shooters that have, that have performed these things, there is a degree of marijuana use. It's hard to exactly find out how much because they're dead, so we don't really know. Uh, but there is some evidence to that. And it's, it's actually well known that marijuana can lead to a feeling of nihilism, where everything really doesn't matter anymore. So you can imagine that if somebody is, is depressed and suicidal and nihilistic, it's, it's an easy, you don't have to connect many dots, in other words, to see how that might go. And uh, if I could show you a map or a graph of the amount of marijuana use in the United States and around the world, that would also be very similar. The other thing too, that I wanted to mention too, is a video that we did on light as medicine. And the point here is that lack of sunlight can lead to depression. There's an area in your brain called the perihabenular nucleus, which gets direct innervation from the retina of your eye, which is stimulated by light. And that, this, is the, this is the reason why people who live in northern latitudes and don't get enough sunlight in the wintertime have seasonal affective disorder. And this is why you can buy those seasonal affective disorder lights to help with that. So um, what, what's happening now? I remember when I was growing up, what did I do when I came home from school and I wanted to play? I went outside. And what did my mom say? Come home when the, you got it. Come home when the lights come on. And, and we would go to bed, right? And was there a phone to look at? And no. So the lights would go off earlier. So the other flip side of this is that when you're exposing your eyes to light when you shouldn't be, that shuts down melatonin production. That shifts your circadian rhythm. You're, you're having um, your circadian rhythm is not in order. You're not sleeping well. And that can lead to depression as well. So uh, it's not just the social media content, but it's the fact of how we're consuming that content that can affect our health in that way as well. As you know, uh, this, this should be a, no surprise to you who guys were here in, in 2015. So it's, it's really uh, something that I, I often think about. All right, so I want to move. We've talked about the epidemiology of, of murder and uh, guns in this country. We've talked about what may be in the minds and what may be precipitating this in the perpetrators of this. Now I want to turn to a little bit more of a medical aspect. As we as physicians, what do we do? 
um, specifically those that are in the first responders and those that are in trauma. Okay, and now I am an ICU physician and I do take care of critical patients, but I typically don't take care of trauma patients. So for those of our colleagues that are in the trauma area, this might be a little bit more of import. Um, but this was a paper that was published back in 2013 by the surgical literature talking about uh, the bullets, okay? So there, each bullet has a particular way that it is uh, manufactured that gives them a specific profile, which is the bullet's ability to increase an in impact. The tumble, which is its ability to change direction once it gets inside the body. And uh, fragmentation, the bullet's ability to break into pieces. So as those change, that can affect the mortality of the victims at a mass shooting site. And so obviously victims with a single low energy bullet that does not change in size on impact and does not tumble to increase its impact and does not break into fragments are more likely to survive. That might be important for someone showing up to a scene that where it actually is in progress and being able to make that assessment. Um, let's, let me go back here. Uh, they say greater attention needs to be made to the victims, which is important. So this is really actually really important as these things become more and more common. And, and actually this goes to the heart of really what we're talking about here in bioethics, because when a first responder goes to the scene, when a, when a police officer goes to the scene, when a law enforcement officer goes to the scene, there are really two competing uh, bioethical concerns that are going on at that time. There's the bioethical concern of justice. So making sure to eliminate the, the perpetrator, to stop them from doing, but there's also the, the need to attend to those that are the victims. And so if we put all of our resources into the justice side, trying to secure the area and ignoring the, the victims, they're not gonna get the appropriate care that they need. They're gonna die more likely. As opposed to uh, putting all of our attention onto the victims to try to get them to the hospital and ignoring the fact that there may still be a perpetrator. You, can you see how just policy that's happening immediately, how that could change? So what uh, this paper is actually advocating for is more of a militaristic uh, approach a militaristic approach would be exactly what they do in the military, which is to go in and to get the victims as quickly as possible and to get them out as possible, while also trying to uh, execute justice, if you will, on the person who is doing it or try to neutralize it. They say greater attention, and right now the, the point is, is that it seems as though more attention is being made on the justice aspect and not enough on the victim aspect, okay? So as there are more and more of these, there's obviously going to be more people in the lurch that we are not giving attention to. And that's why they make this point. They say greater attention uh, of, to the needs of the victims is important. The scene is a medical emergency. Law enforcement personnel must focus simultaneously on the shooter and the patients. A safe environment for EMS to quickly assess patients and begin their treatment, resuscitation, and transportation for definitive care is critical. Documenting the event and gathering evidence can occur while patients are being treated. The first priority needs to be assessment and care of the victims, as noted in the pre-hospital trauma life support program. Patients are the most important people at the scene of the emergency. Okay, this is from the surgical literature. And they actually have come up with something called a tactical emergency medical support. It's specially trained and equipped to function with, within the perimeter of the danger zone. They support the special operations of law enforcement by... Injury control, care under fire, special extraction, tactical rescue, supports the mission of law enforcement while maximizing victims' clinical outcomes and minimizing risk to caregivers. One of the ways they can do that is if they see ordinance, they can make an assessment about what type of bullets these are and what the tumble and all of that sort of stuff to see where we are in, that, in, in terms of that. Um, these are actually the standard of care for military tactical medicine. The American College of Surgeons Committee on Trauma and the National Association of Emergency Medical Technicians have endorsed these guidelines through the PHTLS program. All communities should have rapid access to TEMS. And Loma Linda being a Trauma One Center, I'm sure is no exception, especially since we've actually seen this here in the area. They say, unfortunately, the time has come when intentional civilian mass casualty incidents require a military-like response. This approach will enhance rapid assessment, treatment, and triage of patients. Mass casualty shootings should be viewed as medical scenes where treating patients is a top priority. Um, and they say here, this was back in 2013, so it's a little bit um, specific to that time. They say, although the concepts proposed here would not have saved the 26 Newtown victims, survivability of future cast mass casualty shootings 
will be enhanced if EMS and law enforcement personnel adopt policies and procedures for rapid patient assessment, treatment, and transportation for definitive care. So this, this, is the, this is the graph that we're living with. And I can tell you, I just received an email yesterday from my child's school, just down the street here at Loma Linda Academy, where they are now instituting a, basically a badge pickup system where you can't even get onto the campus unless you have a, a scanned badge to get in. All of the students now will have to be able, will now have to check in to their classes when they go to class so that they will immediately, if there is a mass shooting uh, incident, they will know exactly which students are where at any time. This is basically where we are right now. So this is, this, is the, this is the new reality. This is really telling. This was published in the New England Journal of Medicine back in May uh, of 2022. Notice what we see here. Again, we're looking here in the last couple of years, okay? Notice this blue line. This is motor, motor vehicle crashes affecting uh, children in the, uh, I think it's the 15 to 19 age group. These are adolescents. Huge gains in terms of vehicle safety, right? We all remember growing up, I was, my parents had a station wagon, remember Olivia? My sister's here in the front row. Just throw us in the back, right? And we'd go down the road. And you know, it was great because you could lay out, you didn't have to have your seatbelt on. No more, <laughs> no more does that happen. And, and, and you know, for good reason. But notice that now in 2020, uh, as when this was published, that firearm related injuries are the number one cause for adolescent and young people dying. And it's shot up precipitously. And at the same time that it shot up precipitously, we're seeing drug overdose and poisoning shooting up in the same population at the same time with the same slope, okay? It, you don't have to be rocket scientists or a neurosurgeon, if there's any here, to say think that maybe these things might be connected with each other. And they're both issues that have, I believe, to do with mental health. Hey, everything else is going down, drowning, heart disease, fire burns, chronic respiratory disease, malignant neoplasms, drug overdose, fentanyl probably, and firearm related injuries are going up. So that is the, uh, those are the references. Um, so we've talked about the S, the subjective, the O, the objective. I think we've made a little bit of an assessment. I think the assessment that, that we could make at this point is that there are a lot of murders and life lost in the United States. Most of them are with handguns, not AR-15 assault-style weapons, okay? So if we want to, to put a big dent into that, I think what we need to do is to get to the root cause of the problem. And I think the root cause of the problem is, uh, it has presented itself here based on the data as a, as a mental problem, as a health problem. Now that doesn't necessarily mean that, that physical gun control policy is the wrong way to do it. But because of the country that we live in, because of the policies that we have and our constitution, it's gonna take some creative people legislatively to work on this issue from both ends. And, and that is, in my opinion, an apolitical view of a very serious problem. And I thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, I wanna invite those of you who are here in person to step up to the mic if you have questions um, that you wanna to direct towards um, uh, Dr. Schwelt. Uh, there was one comment um, from the uh, from our online audience. And, and this, uh, this commenter, uh, let me just actually read it straight off. Um, unfortunately, uh, she says, I feel like Uvalde, puts the role and responsibility of law enforcement into question. So presumably going back to um, the thoughts about um, the how you not only rescue the victims, but mm -hmm. also stop uh, the violence from progressing even further. Yeah, so that's we're asking them to do a very difficult job. Uh, we're, we're asking people to go in to an environment where their own lives could be taken, first of all, to, to eliminate the, the shooter, but also to help the victims. Um, you know, it's easy for us to sit back in our armchair and to criticize law enforcement. So I'm not gonna be the first one to do that. I think it's a, I would take the opinion that it's a systems issue 
and uh, and I followed the recommendations from the um, from the surgical literature that says we're really not uh, prepared to deal with this in a way that we have before because of because of, we've never had these kind of issues before. As you can see, these things are just skyrocketing. So taking the more militaristic approach and and training our uh, our law enforcement officers to deal with that in such a way, I think is is going to be the best way going forward. Yeah, but I, I agree with the comment is, is what are we, we're asking them to do something that we haven't, they haven't really been trained to do in that, in that, uh, at that amplitude. Yeah, yeah thank you. Again, I want to invite um, the audience to, oh, uh, Dr. Yu, do you want to come up to the mic? Thanks. This helps us to also be able to, to re record the question for our presentation or our viewers online. Yeah, so I'm, uh, thank you so much for your presentation. I'm kind of going two directions, so I'm only going to just choose one. Uh, it seems like one of the implications of this is, is that if there's going to be a political intervention or public health intervention, it might have to do with like either regulations or warnings with smartphones. Like uh, it, would one of the things we should explore society be warning parents and kids like this is like just like you have like tobacco warning labels that decrease cancer deaths is something we should be looking at in the medical community or social, uh, political community, like warning people about what happens when you introduce kids to highly addictive uh, social media platforms and instruments. So anyway, that's, I guess, a, a, a question or a, co uh, a comment. Yeah, I agree. I completely agree. Uh, it's it's one of those things where it's like, you know, I, I talk about the smartphone and things, but, you know, my fam my own family will find me on it. Like, hey, you've been on that now for like a half an hour. You're like, oh, you're right. I should... It's it's highly addictive and it's for all of us and it makes our lives so much easier, but it also sucks us in as well. Um, and so I feel like, you know, the smoker who understands that I need to quit smoking. But what's the first thing I do within 15 minutes of getting up on the day is, is I as I open up the phone. So, um, yes, I believe that social media and the effects of social media on the human population really have not the effects of that have not been fully elucidated to their amplitude. Uh, to their final endpoint, and um, I believe that we are sort of reaping that at this point, and more needs to be done in, in terms of that. I, I know that the American Academy of Pediatrics has come out with statements about television, about videos um, before the age of five, and, and, and things of that nature, uh, but I believe that, um, so, so that there is a precedent for that, but I think obviously this affects people well over that age, and uh, something needs to be done, I agree. Thank you. Yes, please. Thank you, Dr. Schultz, for your presentation. Um, I had the opportunity to visit my uh, son and daughter-in-law in Singapore, and they lived in a 15-story high condominium apartment type building. And I have a 10-year-old granddaughter. And when I was there for two weeks, she's depressed. She's up late at night without them knowing that she's on their iPad. And of course, as a grandma, and she's my only grandchild, um, I couldn't keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> and so I weighed in on the fact that I felt that she needed more playtime um, daily. And I tried to explain to them, I played with other children in the neighborhood every moment I could when I was growing up. And so I made it my, my goal in that two-week period that I was going to find her a playmate. And it was wonderful. I did. I found another 10-year-old girl who spoke, who was uh, Chinese and my granddaughter's half Chinese, and they both speak fluent English and fluent Chinese. So for me to find that in Singapore is not hard to do, but it was just wonderful to do that because now they play together. And so I'm so grateful so that when I go back, I'm hoping that she's having a more, what I would consider a more normal playtime. But I just wanted to share that because I think that not only do we have all of this wonderful data, but how many families are growing up in high-rise apartment type 
environments where it's only natural that your children are more indoors. There's not a lot of outdoor activities or space. And maybe this is a social problem just based on the way we're living, our, in, our living environments are changing and we don't necessarily want our children out on streets playing. I get that too. But anyway, I just- I could, I could speak that. for an hour, uh, literally, I could speak for an hour on the, the benefits of being outside. Um, we have been, we've been uh, told over and over again that we need to avoid the sun, that the sun causes skin damage. And I appreciate that. Uh, obviously, there are some dermatological conditions that can be made worse by ultraviolet radiation. But the benefits of near-infrared radiation, which can penetrate through uh, clothes um, and just visible light, which is much higher outside. Like in here, you would be very surprised. In here, the, the lux, uh, which is a measure of intensity of light, is about 50 lux, if you were to measure it. On a bright, sunny day outside, it's 100,000 lux. That's the difference that we're talking about. And so just going outside in 100,000 lux, you know, right now it's, it's in the wintertime, so it may not be that high, but you can get a tremendous amount of input to those areas of the brain that you need to get. As Americans, we spend 93% of our waking hours inside. We, we, we wake up in our home, we go to our garage, we open the garage, we go drive to work, we park in a parking structure, which takes us in a, from a covered parking structure into our office, which has a window that is, that is um, demanded by the state of California and many other states to have be able to block near-infrared radiation. Why? Because near-infrared radiation heats up the room and you want to save on costs of air conditioning. So, so we, we, have, we have created an environment around ourselves that... Um, devoids us of, of the sun. And I believe that there's a lot of benefits from that. I could speak an hour about that, like I said, but I'm, I'm glad that you were able to at least reach one person. Yeah. Go ahead, Grace. Oh, I'd, I want to get to a question online and then we'll go to the questions here. Um, uh, one commenter is asking, opponents to gun control cite anecdotes of the good guy with the gun. Are there any studies that have looked at averted mass shootings or those that were stopped mid-course by civilian gun users and compare their relative incidence to mass shootings or studies that, that attempted to project a number of lives saved by these uh, civilians. Okay, so there's two aspects to this. There is how many people were actually shot justifiably and prevented it. But what we can't determine is how many people in their mind would have done something, but because somebody had a gun, they didn't do it. That that I haven't seen a study on. I'm, obviously, there are some. There's no question. There are people that would have done something, but because an officer had a gun, it wasn't done. But if you look here, um, you know, of the of the forty to fifty thousand, uh, forty thousand uh, murders that happen in the United States, how many of them are justifiable homicides by either a peace officer or a civilian? It's about seven hundred. So it's less than three percent. Yeah. I, I don't know if that gets to the question, but I understand what they're, they're not asking about the 700. They're asking about if, if, if all guns were gone and it was, and, and it was free reign, how much crime would, have ha would be happening in that? And I'm sure there are, there are sophisticated studies that you can do. I'm just not aware exactly what that showed. You mean if all gun control were gone and, yeah, yeah, and it, people could correct. carry guns well, and stuff? Well, obviously the, 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 the people who don't follow the laws, aren't going to follow the gun laws. Yes. So they would be able to have free reign and, and kill whoever they wanted. I, I don't know the studies on that. Yeah. Thank yeah. you. I think uh, a question here. Oh, okay. Yeah. Actually, then. Um, I'm Dr. Ryan Hayden, one of the um, trauma surgeons here. Excellent. And I've had an interesting life um, experiment, you might say. I trained to do surgery in Detroit, um, which is known as one of the knife and gun clubs of America, and had over 500 gunshots a year come to our hospital. Um, Detroit is literally across the Detroit River from Windsor, and at that same time, um, Windsor didn't get more sunlight than Detroit. There weren't less iPhones in Windsor than Detroit, yeah. but there were almost no murders in Windsor compared to Detroit. In fact, the populations are not much different in those two cities. And to say that it is iPhones would say that Canadians are not using iPhones, but we are, or Japanese are not using iPhones, and we are. And I think that um, simplifying it to say it's a light, you know, it's we have depression because we use iPhones. That might be true. But why is that not explain the differences between Canada and America? And so I would I don't think we can oversimplify that. And 
I then moved to Malawi, Africa. I lived there for 10 years as a trauma surgeon in Malawi, Africa. And in those 10 years, had zero gunshots <laughs> for 10 years. There were machete wounds. And I have yet in my life to have lost somebody to a stabbing. I haven't, if they get to my hospital alive, I can save their life with a stabbing, not with a gunshot. And so there's a major difference on the injuries involved. I came back to America in 2020 and again, gunshot wounds is every day. And so I, I hadn't seen, I dealt with zero murders in Malawi, Africa for 10 years, but I'm back, now back here. And so I think that I would like us to not oversimplify by saying, if you move north and there's less sunlight, there will be more murders because Canada is right above us. And so, and if you could explain in any of those why Windsor is so much different than Detroit, I would say, oh, that makes sense. Now, I would say that I have never seen anybody also be murdered with a um, shotgun. It, I, if I was to say everybody should get one gun, it could be a double barrel shotgun because it's great for defense. I think just the sound of ch -ch might be enough. <laughs> Yeah. You can't commit suicide with a shotgun very easily. It is very difficult with a long gun to commit sure. suicide. And it wouldn't be a mass murder weapon. And I think that you probably can't walk around the streets of Detroit with a shotgun very easily. So I think, I mean, I'm not for or against um, some things, but I do think that probably the number of guns in society makes the difference between Detroit and Windsor. Yeah, thank you for your for your uh, points there. Um, I, I'm from Toronto, so I know all about Windsor and Detroit. <laughs> so I think I think um, I want to be clear about what I'm saying is is the when it comes to the the mass shooting. So the, in terms of the sunlight, the depression, what I'm referring to is the is the young person who wants to commit suicide and is pulling out the AR-15 style weapon, and that again makes up just this amount right here. So I'm not saying that the, the sunlight and the all of that is, I believe what you're seeing in Detroit is from this. And I don't think that's gonna, I don't think that's gonna go down with taking away the iPhones. I don't think that's gonna go away because that was always there, okay? What I'm referring to when it comes to our, this precipitous increase in just the last couple of years, that's obviously after you were working in Detroit. Um, what I'm talking about is the young people who are becoming more depressed, who are, um, maybe smoking marijuana, if that's one of the things that is, is doing it. And as a result of that, are picking up, they're nihilistic, they're picking up AR-15 style weapons, and they're doing it. So what I'm trying to explain is not this, but this. And this is a very small percentage of what's going on here. Uh, sorry, where did it go? You know what I was just to show, that, the pie graph, yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, and that and I could show you another graph that shows uh, all fifty states and the gun laws that are are ranked from the most uh, the most um, like California, okay, all the way down to the least, like down in in Alabama, okay. And there's a definite correlation. The strongest gun laws have the least amount of gun deaths. There are some exceptions to that. Illinois is one of those. They have very strong gun laws, but the stuff that goes on in Chicago on a daily basis, obviously kind of goes against us. We also in California have a lot of gun violence, even though we have very strong gun laws. And that has to do with gangs and other things of that nature, but point well taken, yeah. Uh, so I am sorry, uh, Dr. Schultz, we have a, a few minutes left and I do wanna take the time to actually to dig a little bit more deeper as much as we can in a sure. few minutes. Between the link of mental health uh, diagnoses and also uh, mass shootings, so I guess what I want to clarify is that not every person who has um, trauma in their childhood or not everybody who has um, had thoughts of suicide, uh, not everybody is going to uh, be the cause of a mass shooting. Um, and how can we not let these concerns, these justifiable concerns, yes, how can we still be able to reach uh, patients uh, who really desperately need our help? Yeah, great question. So how many times have you seen someone that does the mass shoot and then they interview people and like, oh yeah, he was kind of thought he might've been you know, doing this, right? But it's like, well, how many other people do you know like that? Are we gonna turn everybody in that does that, right? So um, just like in smoking, I, I was surprised as a pulmonologist to learn that only 15% of people who smoke get COPD, 15 to 20%, right? You'd think like, 80 to 90% of people who smoke would get COPD. 
But it's the same thing here. I mean, how many people have had early childhood trauma, sexual, physical uh, bullying, parental suicides that don't go out and shoot everybody? So valid point. Um, how is that going to be helpful in us pinpointing and determining who's at risk? I think, um, I think more studies need to be done, and hopefully we can, we can find out who these people are and give them the help that they need. If you look, though, I, I will have to say, if you look at what has happened in this country, again, another bioethics uh, topic, to autonomy, which is a very important uh, um, bioethical uh, concern and pillar, and beneficence, treatment, what has happened to our inpatient psychiatric units uh, in, in our country? What has happened to our ability to develop, to deliver true psychiatric care for patients? I think it's, it's more limited than it's ever been. It's more limited. I, I work at Redlands Community Hospital. We used to have an inpatient psychiatric unit because it's so difficult to get accreditation and it's so diff and the amount of money that has to be poured into it. We are now contracting out our services, which is, I mean, what happens when pe people come in, they try to commit suicide, they're in my intensive care unit and I've downgraded them to the point where they're medically stable. Now, what do we do? It's, it's almost like a telemedicine. It's almost like a revolving door. So I think uh, definitely psychiatric services need to be increased, especially with what we're seeing right now. Yeah. I hope that answered your question. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. I really appreciate it. Um, want to be cognizant of your time. Um, it's one o'clock. I want to continue the conversation um, going. But for those of you who are um, uh, joining us online, thank you so much. We appreciate your presence. Um, for those of you who wanted to watch this video again or want to refer somebody else to watch this, uh, we will be uh, uploading this onto our website. Uh, so if you go to um, the Center for, if you just Google Center for Christian Bioethics, Loma Linda University, that'll take you to our website and we'll have that uploaded on our website. So, but let's uh, give a round of applause for Dr. Schwab. Thank you.